Hello, everyone. It's hearty to see so many of you on a Friday night, having had such a lovely day earlier on. Um, and we are keen to discuss methane and its role in the climate and ecological emergency. For those who don't know SICA, it stands for the Southeast Climate Alliance. We are a coalition of environmental, community and faith groups from the southeast of England, uniting for urgent action on the climate crisis. SICA acts as an umbrella group which functions informally as a network. We are proud that we have now around 110 member organizations and more than 500 individual members. So very briefly, SICA was set up in February 2019 to share ideas and coordinate action. Besides being a platform through which we bring people together for a common cause, a large part of our work has centered around district and county councils across the Southeast, from Hampshire, Isle of Wight, through to Sussex, Surrey and Kent. We have a website, a Facebook and Twitter social media presence, and you can subscribe to our newsletters. All of these are filled with useful information and resource for individuals, organizations and councils. So some of you don't know me, I'm Viviane Ducey, and I volunteer on the steering committee for SICA. I've been part of this group since its inception, and I've been assisted on this, on, in organizing this event by Erica and Sean. So just a quick rundown of what, we'll, what we're presenting today. Um, this session will last around one and a half hours. In the last half hour, Jill Sutcliffe, who is co-hosting with me, will facilitate the audience questions and discussions. If you think of any questions during the presentations and along the way, please use the letter Q in the chat box. We will be able to pick up those questions. Jill is from Sussex and an avid and long-term campaigner against fracking and other damaging activities. The two speakers from the SICA group today are Danny Lee and Emily Mott. Danny is a trustee of the two climate action groups across Petersfield and Winchester. Um, he will set the scene to bring everyone up to speed with methane. Emily is of the Wheeled Action Group, an umbrella organization which presents local groups campaign, campaigning against all forms of oil and gas extraction across the Wheeled and the Isle of Wight. Emily will share with us some investigational findings at several of the onshore oil and gas plants across the southeast of England. Our guest speaker today is James Turito, who is the campaign manager for the Clean Air Task Force, and you will hear more from all of these, all of them soon. So reducing methane emissions is absolutely vital, yet often overlooked as part of combating our climate emissions. And perhaps it's partly because of its invisible nature that, that this, is, this is the case. So to set the scene, I will show a very short one minute video clip by the United Nations Environment Programme called Invisible Emissions. And then I'll hand over to Danny to give us the full overview of methane. not all about cows and over to you Danny to tell us more. Brilliant thank you very much well uh, good evening everybody um, my name is uh, Danny Lee and uh, as, as Vivian said kindly introduction I'm from the Winchester Action on Climate Change and the Petersfield Climate Action Network uh, where I'm a trustee um, amongst other things I do stuff in consens sustainable construction uh, in terms of lobbying and I do uh, clean tech or sustainable uh, investment research for an investment club in the Mion Valley in Hampshire. Um, the topic today, uh, in terms of the way I'm phrasing it, is methane's role in the climate and ecological emergency, a neglected factor, and I deliberately put it as a question, uh, which hopefully we can pick up in um, the discussion period. Just trying to change the uh, slide. Here we go. So, uh, as the little uh, vignette of a video said uh, earlier, um, this is a invisible, odorless, and sometimes a sweet oil type smell 
gas has no color. It's a simple saturated hydrocarbon with a chemical formula CH4. And I may use the term CH4 as a shorthand uh, at times during this presentation, so forgive me. It's a flammable non-toxic gas, but can be deadly when mixed with other gases. And no surprise, it can displace oxygen to induce asphyxiation. Um, when methane is spilled into the air before being used or captured, it absorbs heat from the sun, warming up the atmosphere like a greenhouse gas. Um, some stats, um, there, what I'm picking up on is about 1,800 parts per billion. That's about two cups of water in a swimming pool in the atmosphere, but it's 200 times less concentrated in the atmosphere than carbon, but is remarkably more effective uh, at trapping heat. And hence it's sometimes known as a short-lived climate force, as the little vignette of the video said, because of its short uh, time frame of existing in the atmosphere. Okay, so it's the second uh, biggest greenhouse gas. Um, 9% doesn't seem much, but actually it's, it, it punches about it above its weight, as you will see. Um, in terms of global warming potential, I've already touched on that. Over a hundred year period, uh, it's 23 to 36 times uh, um, in, in terms of its lifetime in the atmosphere. Um, and the, hence why I say 23 to 36 is because it depends on what, where you calculate this and how you calculate this. But I think the important thing is to look at it in relative terms to carbon, if that's index one, methane is generally 23 times more powerful. So why, why is it important? Well, there is this massive rise in methane levels in the atmosphere, as measured uh, from Antarctic ice core data, um, as sampled by global networks of air sampling sites, and as seen uh, with uh, some of our clever satellites. Sorry. Okay, so the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, they have three working groups. The first one, I'm sure you recall the Code Red for Humanity back in August last year. And um, it picked up in this report, uh, in terms of the physical science, for the first time, it produced more data than ever before, putting the spotlight on methane as a, as a, as a gas, a greenhouse gas of real concern. Um, just for completeness, I just picked up, pick up on the other uh, working group two reports because we've just had the February one about adaptation and vulnerability. Um, we're about to have the third one. It's imminent, uh, end of this month, beginning of April. Uh, and this will focus on um, mitigation and greenhouse gas removal. So clearly uh, that's pertinent to methane. And then we get a synthesis of these three reports. The fourth report in October uh, in preparation for the November Conference of Parties number 27 uh, were to be held in Egypt when the UK hands over the uh, chairmanship of the, the COP process to Egypt. So if you look at the report, uh, it, it's, it tells you how much the earth has already warmed, 1.07 degrees due to carbon dioxide and methane. And then if you look at the breakdown, three quarters of a degree from carbon and half a degree from methane. Yeah, and of course there are other greenhouse gases in, in the mix. And then another factor to think consider is sulfur dioxide. You'll see why I'm saying that in a minute, because it has a cooling effect of half a degree. Okay, so by lowering methane emissions, it's critical because it help us avoid rapid warming as we reduce our carbon dioxide emissions. However, reduction in carbon dioxide is accompanied by a decrease in sulfur dioxide emissions. And that's because it's part of the combustion uh, uh, process in terms of energy production. So as you reduce that, you also get the, the, uh, the added benefit of the, of the cooling effect from sulfur dioxide. And the, the message is that if you cut methane emissions by 40 to 45 degrees by 2030, you get an immediate slowing down of the rate of global heat, uh, heating and you can shave about 0.3 of a degree off the increase in global temperatures by 2040. And uh, you'll see that in the, in the United Nations report. So obviously methane is very important. It comes from multiple sources, human and natural. We'll look at the breakdown in a minute. I've already said it's the second biggest greenhouse gas after carbon. I've already talked about its, uh, its powerful effect compared to, to carbon. Uh, it accounts for about 30% of global warming since pre-industrial times and is proliferating, as I said, faster than ever before. 
And the other thing that is not often talked about is a primary contributor to the formation of ground level ozone. That's an oxygen uh, O2 with an extra oxygen molecule, O3, which is a hazardous air pollutant. And you recall in the summer, you know, uh, UV rates are high. And sometimes they even might talk about ozone levels because it has a major impact on breathing. And globally, it's causing 1 million premature deaths every year. And it also impacts on nature, and I'll pick up on it later. So the other key thing why it's important is that there's significant climate clean air benefits can be achieved if we reduce methane. And we have existing techniques, low cost targeted measures, uh, and when combine that with methane short lived atmospheric lifetime, it can make a big difference. So here's the breakdown. So I'll just pick up on the human induced methane. 60% of all of that is caused by humans. Agriculture circa 37%. And that is projected to grow by 30% by 2050. We don't change our ways. Um, I think uh, uh, the startling figure about um, livestock is that we've got something like 1.4 billion cattle in the world. So that just puts it into perspective. Um, we're going to talk about natural, uh, the oil, oil uh, fossil fuel side later with the other speakers, so I won't dwell on that. Waste management, microbes and landfills, sewage treatment plants, that is of course another source of methane. This is the methane cycle, this just gives you a quick overview in a, in a colored, colored picture about uh, you know, transfer of methane in soil to air by plants, the digestive process, by termites, that sort of thing, burning uh, biomass, uh, trees, forests, etc. Uh, soil activity, uh, digestive processes in animals, plant decay in natural wetlands, and rice paddies, of course. And then there's obviously landfills and some of the other stuff I just mentioned. And, and not to forget uh, seabeds rich in hydrates and cath cathrates, which are there all the time. And, and of course, the melting tundra uh, permafrost, which is releasing methane uh, as we speak. Now, if you look at it in terms of global methane budget, um, start on the left hand side and you've got uh, fossil fuel production. Let's call that about 20 percent. Agriculture waste, 30 percent. And you've got a flux in the middle of biomass and biofuel burning. Uh, and then you've got a massive 30 uh, percent uh, hit from wetlands. And then you've got uh, other, uh, which is um, natural emissions and, and the processes already mentioned. And then, of course, you would expect in, in the na natural world for it to be balanced by um, chemical reactions, sinks in the atmosphere, and then sinks to soil. And then, but no surprise, the pace of, uh, of our emissions induced by humans is our pacing the ability of the sinks to do the, co the compensating. And so there's a net gain into the atmosphere. A pretty picture to just illustrate what I've been saying a different way sources down the left hand side, you can read those yourself. Impacts on the right, which I've touched on. Um, it, again, you're, it's confusing when you talk about global warming because you know, is it 86 or is it 23? It depends on the, on the period of time you're looking at. So you know, you had 23 times more powerful over 100 years, 86 times more powerful over 20 years. Okay, and that's how the global warming potential um, um, messages are put. Um, I just want to focus on the bottom two, and I will pick up on this again, um, is tropospheric ozone air pollution, okay, and the impact on health, and I'll just, I'll come, in, I'll come back to that, and I just want to highlight this impact on agriculture and ecosystems, the 15% annual yield losses on, for some of our major crops, uh, quite worrying. So the atmosphere, so we're, we live in the troposphere, which is a bit closer to the earth, obviously. And this is where the tropospheric ozone uh, becomes an issue. Uh, ozone in the stratosphere, just out of interest, protects us from UV, but when it's in the troposphere, it's the converse of that. So tropospheric ozone is a short-lived climate pollutant. It's atmospheric lifetime of hours to weeks. It has no direct emission source, it's a secondary gas formed by the interaction of sunlight with hydrocarbons, including methane, and of course, nitrous oxide, which as you know, comes in vehicles, fossil fuel plants, and so on. And the effect on the climate is, is, is also uh, uh, inducing heating impacts on evaporation rates, cloud formation, rain, atmospheric circulations. 
And no surprise, a lot of this is focused in the Northern Hemisphere where a lot of the industrial processes happen. And again, just to put it another way, I've talked about uh, in, in, the, in the middle here, stratosphere, where it, it is, ozone is, is a positive uh, uh, benefit and it's a negative benefit in the uh, troposphere. So sunlight with methane, all these other things that we do in terms of industrial process, carbon monoxide, non-methane volatile organic compounds with the nitrogen oxides creates the O3, impact contributes to global warming, causes all these health problems, is toxic to plants, reduces crop yield, and, and so on and so on. And uh, tropospheric ozone damages plants and the ability to sequester, capture carbon, which doubles the climate impact. Quick word about COP26. So the good news was uh, the EUS and the EU, you may recall, announced a global partnership to cut emissions of methane by 2030. UK was part of that, and the aim is to reduce by 30% compared with 2020 levels. Well, that's great. And the other good news, of course, is that these pledges come from countries with nearly half of all methane uh, emissions, which makes up 70% of the global GDP. However, and if those of you who may be cleverer than me, uh, may be able to find it, but I cannot find the UK methane reduction plan, which uh, should be uh, in place, I would have thought by now, at least in out outline, by Bayes, the business uh, department, uh, maybe Ofgem, the Office for uh, uh, Gas and Electricity. Um, but again, we can pick up on this in discussion. To me, uh, you know, it should run in parallel with our carbon reductions. So in con conclusion, Methane, in my mind, has a key role, and the IPCC, I think, have concluded that as well, in the climate and ecological emergency. Yes, it's more effective at trapping heat in the Earth's atmosphere than CO2, but fortunately, it breaks down faster. This raises the, the hope that quick action can curb emissions to keep global warming below 1.5 with the dramatic cuts I've outlined. Remember, that's that 0.3 notwithstanding the loss of the 0.5 of sulfur dioxide, uh, if that uh, is reduced dramatically at the same time. So reducing methane is one of the most cost-effective strategies to rapidly reduce rate of warming and with big health benefits. And the worry is I cannot find the UK action plan. To me, that's a neglected factor. So that's uh, my piece. Thank you for listening to me. I'll now hand over to uh, Emily. Thank you, Danny. That was excellent. And thank you, Viv, for organizing tonight. Welcome, everybody from all over. I don't know where everyone's from, but I recognize some of your faces. Um, I want to open with a clip from James Torito. He's going to be speaking after me. It's a, it's a clip from one of the Horndean Wells, which is just down the road from my house. Um, it's on the border. It's on the border of West Sussex and Hampshire in Hampshire, just, just on the A3. Um, between Petersfield and Havant. Um, I wanted to show you what we've been campaigning about because there's nothing like seeing the gases. We saw a bit of it in the, the clip from Viv, but um, seeing something that's just down the road is a little more um, pertinent. Um, I just wanted also to say that um, James, well, he, you'll hear from him later, but he's uh, he was fantastic. He came to the UK and traveled around filming different oil and gas sites and um, it's wonderful. I, I had the great opportunity of also going in 2017 with Sharon Wilson from Texas, who's also um, and also films the invisible methane. And we went um, compliments of Friends of the Earth and we traveled for 10 days. I was her driver and we went to visit campaign sites all over from um, Lincolnshire and Yorkshire and Dorset and it was just an incredible opportunity to meet a lot of the campaigners because at that point fracking was very much um, talk it was very much a possibility um, so I'm just going to show you that clip and then I'll tell you a little bit about the grassroots campaigning that's going on in and across the wheeled okay This is the Horndean. This is just one site where there, this is what you're, what you're seeing is the methane coming out that's cold vented. 
So on all or at oil and gas sites across the country, this is happening. Um, some, most, most countries will be flaring, but in England, unfortunately, they are not anymore. Uh, uh, just a second. This is a map and all the red dots will show you the oil and gas sites in the UK. And here's a map of our local Southeast area. You, let's see, um, can you guys all see that? This is Horndean, the site which I just showed you. Derek, who's here tonight is focusing on this site, but we've got, um, Jill here working at Broadford Bridge and so on. Um, so how is it possible that an oil well like the one you just witnessed in Horndean is able to pollute directly to the atmosphere? We've discovered that the oil and gas industry is essentially self-regulated. We learned a lot of things um, about the challenging challenges of proper monitoring and how the planning and regulatory system failed to adequately protect our communities and nature. Campaigners have found breaches of planning, regulatory and environmental conditions across the board at almost every onshore oil well we researched. We've lobbied, protested, gone to court. The work of everyday people from Dorset to Preston, Lincolnshire to Surrey is amazing. And in a lot of cases we're winning, but how did we get here? Um, in 2014, if you recall, Cameron and the government announced it was going all out for shale. They wanted to model the industry after the success of the UK, US fracking industry, all the while MPs claiming that the UK had gold standard regulations, assuring everyone that what happened in the US with the cowboy oil and gas industry would never happen here. Um, the, the destruction of the landscape, the pollution, dumping toxic waste into rivers, that, that, that wasn't gonna happen here. So they went about incentivizing the oil and gas business by changing legislation through the infrastructure bill. They lowered business rates and added the growth duty through the Deregulation Act of 2015. Under this new growth duty, regulators had to be seen to promote economic growth to consider the financial burden of regulations before imposing them. Uh, the regulatory system appeared to favor industry over environment. Government essentially moved the goalposts. They even changed the definition of fracking in the UK so that most of the drilling in the map that you see down in front of you would no, therefore would um, no longer be defined as fracking and wouldn't therefore fall under the same protection regulations that were being created for the fracking industry. Um, the EA has been stripped of two thirds of its funding since 2010 and it's been power, it's powerless and forced into a place where they have to be seen not to hinder industry. So we've all seen the impact of these cuts recently with the water companies and the horrendous state of the UK rivers. It's similar with the, U, with the oil and gas industry. Um, this here in front of you is a photograph from our tour, my tour with Sharon, and this is somewhere in the Midlands. I'm not remembering the site, um, James might remember, but this is just an example of old infrastructure. You can see the rust, the rust. And you can see here, this is where, if we had the floor camera on that, we'd see cold venting, yeah? So it's, um, that's just one example of one of the places, uh, one of the many places. So you might have leaking here, here. We didn't, we were behind a fence so we couldn't go and film this, but if it was properly regulated, you'd have monthly visits or bi you know, biannual visits at least, or, or the industry would have to film this with a camera, but they don't. So what we'll have is leaks and cold venting, um, in some cases flaring. Um, what they should, and I'll tell you later what they should be doing. Um, here's another site where you see they're the nodding donkeys and it looks like they're having a workover. And there's Sharon visiting the site, that's Lincolnshire. 
So government um, changed the definition and, and created an atmosphere that was friendly for developers. New license areas were released and campaigners in the Southeast were faced with a flurry of applications for oil and gas projects that, that I wanna say all over the country, not just the Southeast, but since we're in the Wheeled Action Group, that's what I'm focusing on. Um, po but policies just weren't in place to deal with unconventional oil and gas development. Little by little, through series of freedom of information questions and by analyzing the regulation, we learned that the older, older wells such as Kimmeridge, Singleton, Horndean, wells across the country have been operating for years without any scrutiny. There was no permitting for below ground activities and very little for above ground. When and if the EA caught up with them, the fine would be cheaper than the mitigation. The photograph in front of you now is these. This is the flaring. So they'll be flaring the, the the they'll be flaring the natural gases, which would be methane. But when they flare them, and these are big drums, where at night you'll see that you can often see the the flares going up. Um, that turns into CO two and other VOCs like benzene, toluene, all sorts of noxious chemicals that are released in the air. Um, Philip Maber, who's here tonight, he lives just a quarter mile to the side, and he's done wonderful work documenting and keeping an eye on on these wells. But look at the rust. I mean, this is the state of it's it's horrendous, um, and that is the sign explaining the explosive atmosphere um, <clears throat> that is happening at Singleton. That is, Singleton is in the middle of the forest. It, you can't see it. It's up a road, a private road, surrounded by trees, and it's in the South Downs National Park. And we have been trying really hard to, to um, raise awareness about this site. Um, not that we want to shut it down, because it's the third biggest producer in the country, which doesn't mean a lot. It's actually not producing very much, but um, it's an interesting case study because they have, they applied to, they applied for drilling and they said they were going to feed the gas into the grid. And then they also said at one point that they were going to feed, um, compress the gas and tank it off. And then they said they were, you know, all sorts of things that they never, never materialized. So when they go originally to planning, said this would be at the South Downs Park or West Sussex County Council, they, they, they apply and then they say what they're going to do with the gas. They, they don't say they're going to emit tons and tons of noxious gases. They say, oh, we're going to do something good with that gas, which is what they should do, but they don't. And the repercussions are nil. Um, so... This is again, these are, these are the separating tanks at Singleton. And this was taken when James was here recently in the autumn. And this, I'm gonna show you a little video of that. Those are the tanks. And this is, that's what you see with your naked eye. And the next slide shows you um, what James's FLIR camera shows you. That's the methane. Yeah, we don't see the methane, but it's there always. And th these tanks, these are leaks coming out. These are unauthorized leaks coming out of the top. Coming out here, 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 and 24 seven. We can only imagine, I mean, we weren't filming 24 seven, so I can't say 24 seven, but I imagine it's all day, every day. 365 days of the year. Um, so let's see, back to my text. The government, so the government created this atmosphere that's friendly for developers. And, and Derek, who's here tonight, has can attest to the fact that we have sent, we sent notices about these leaks. We sent them to our MP, our counselors, the the HSE, the EA, the planning, the planning authority, um, even the emergency um, responders from West Sussex County Council and nothing has happened. And that was in October. So, and, and, and we keep repeating these letters month after month, but, but it's not considered important. Um, so, so 
so back to Hornbeam, the production in July 2021 was at 111 barrels a day. That's 0.9% of UK production for a day. Emissions from the site directly correlate, with the, correlate to the volume of oil produced. So it's just an estimate. They don't actually measure it. They just say, okay, if we produce such and such a volume of oil, this is how much will be emitted. Um, at Singleton, there are eight points of emissions flaring from the two giant drums I showed you a picture of before. And, and that turns the methane into the, the benzene, toluene, CO2. Um, and then emissions of methane come from the cold venting and storage tanks. Okay, so this is what you're seeing here. Also during well workovers and transport. So the cold venting is what you saw at Horndean. That's when you don't flare it, it's just released directly. And that's methane for the most part. Um, and most of these operators such as iGas at Singleton are told to operate using the best available techniques. Um, so OGA listed the VOCs from Singleton to be 5,459 tons from 2018 to 2019. That's tons of VOC, so including methane. And the, the upper limit of methane is so high that they just don't regulate that. Um, at Horse Hill in Surrey, UK oil and gas is seeking permission at the moment to flare up to 10 tons of natural methane a day, which is enough to heat over 3,000 homes in a year. So when James from the Clean Air Task Force toured England, he discovered significant emissions of methane at most of the onshore oil and gas sites across England. Every single site will no doubt have leaks or be cold venting. And this is, I'm sorry, that's a list of the contaminants um, typically found in the VOCs. This is be, just methane is, methane is one of these. So when the natural gas is released and then gets burned, it turns into a combination of toxic chemicals, compounds, okay? All with not very good health effects. I mean, we're lucky that, that these sites are not close to major developments. So in a place like Texas, this is, this is fracking at its worst. This is the Permian Basin. So this is, this is when the government says they wanna go all out for fracking, this is what would be implied because you can only get oil from the area with, from which you drill, right? It's not a reservoir underground that's waiting like a lake. So this is what you're seeing in Texas right now. All of these would be venting methane. It's, it's as Sharon Wilson said, hell on earth. Um, so when, what is our goal? The question is, what, what are we doing and, and, and what do we hope to achieve? The, the campaign against new oil development in the Southeast is to wear, raise awareness of the pollution, the environmental degradation, and to inhibit further growth of the oil industry. We raise awareness about the pollution so we can avoid project creep that allows companies in rural areas to keep extending planning permission. And so that decade after decade, resulting in tons of emissions, masses of radioactive water and waste. Um, the energy sector accounts for 18% methane. It might be more as, as Danny said, but I found 18%. Um, if the companies would monitor for leaks and repairs, the flare could um, to flare and not cold vent. Um, the smaller amounts using auto ignition systems and to capture the larger emissions and feed it back to the grid, then that, that would be a big start. Um, if we're gonna reach our climate targets, we need to eliminate all flaring. So we need to advocate for better rules that protect green, clean air, water, and our health from mining and drilling. We need to put pressure on these companies to capture the gas, close up shop, clean as much as possible and leave so that we can regenerate the landscape. Together, we can hold these polluting industries accountable and reform the inadequate and outdated laws. So uh, we haven't even begun to discuss the health impacts but there's so much more and um, we welcome any of you to join WAG or, or any of the smaller groups in, in fighting fossil fuels. We have some really good news today that comes just in time for tonight's um, 
event and that, that UCOG, which is UK oil and gas, will not be appealing the planning refusal to drill on the Isle of Wight. So that's it's not going to happen, which is fantastic news. So thank you to all of you who, who are here and who campaigned against that. Um, but we also have to remember the Tory conference is going on and they're going to be discussing and releasing their energy security strategy. And with the Ukraine, with the Russian war in Ukraine, we have to um, we have to really be strong and keep on campaigning because, as you saw, there were so many people in the last two weeks who started raising the fracking flag again. There's a moratorium, though, and hope and and we did hear that shale gas companies have received refunds on their license fees because of the moratorium. So that's also good news. Um, I'm going to now just show you a few more pictures of our wonderful campaigners. And I'd like to introduce James Torito, who, who joined Clean Air Task Force as a campaign manager in October 2020 to work with the environmental organizations, civil society groups, media, industry, and government officials on methane emissions reduction worldwide. He's based in Berlin, Germany, and is currently focused on methane abatement in the oil and gas industry in Europe, with some work in Africa and South America. Welcome, James, and thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, I was just sharing a link to uh, all the videos from the October tour that Emily uh, highlighted already. Um, so, and, and thank you very much, everyone, for participating in this and for Vivian for putting it together and for Danny on such an excellent presentation outlining the problem of methane uh, and you know some of the solutions that are out there to solve it. So I want to, uh, let me just share my screen first. Um, so I want to um, take this opportunity to talk uh, about um, what it's been like tracking methane emissions in the oil and gas industry in Europe, what I've been seeing, um, where methane is occurring, uh, methane emissions are occurring in the oil and gas industry, what can be done about it, uh, and, and really like what Clean Air Task Force is doing and also what our plans are for working, doing additional work in the UK as well. So my name is, is James Trudeau, as uh, Emily mentioned and as Vivian has mentioned. Uh, I'm a campaign manager with the Clean Air Task Force. I've been with Clean Air Task Force for a year and a half, we're an international environmental organization based in the US with an office in Europe, and we have operations around the world. We're focused on methane in the oil and gas industry because 75% of these emissions can be cut at little to no cost to companies. And actually, I think the IEA, the International um, Energy Agency recently announced at the current gas prices, uh, most of the, the, these emissions can be cut at zero cost to companies and, and um, many times negative costs now. Um, so thank you very much, Southeast Climate Alliance, for putting this webinar together. And I'm excited to talk more about this. Um, so uh, for the past year and a half, I've been working closely with media outlets and civil society groups across Europe. Um, many local uh, groups and activists like yourselves, many large national environmental groups uh, as well, and then EU-based groups. Uh, and so uh, we're building a campaign to document methane emissions in the oil and gas industry. A large part of our focus has been on the EU um, so most of my travel in the last year has been within the EU, and that's specifically because the EU is, is considering and going through the process of developing regulations on methane emissions in the energy sector. Uh, those will have a big implication on the UK, as I'm going to talk about shortly, um, but during this presentation, I'm going to share with you what I found and, and how we can begin to regulate these methane emissions. So. This is an overview of what I've done. I've probably been to more than 350 sites across 12 countries, uh, documented emissions at, at more than 230 of those sites. Many of these sites I've revisited uh, weeks, months, 
well, days, weeks, months later and found continuous emissions at those facilities. Uh, and I've detected emissions at, at about more than 60% of the sites I visited. Uh, some countries that figure has been more like 90% of the sites or even higher. Uh, we've, we've managed to get a lot of media attention, which is great. And we try to partner with as many media outlets and journalists as possible because it's the best way to, to really get the message out there and put uh, pressure on policymakers to act. But um, before I get into the presentation, I'm going to talk about where methane emissions are occurring and, and how I've been detecting them in the kind of facilities that I've visited. Um, so this is an outline of the oil and gas supply chain in Europe. Um, this looks similar to um, what the oil and gas supply chain looks around the world uh, to some extent, uh, depending on a country's infrastructure and, and the UK, um, this, is, this is probably more of what the UK has. Europe. Uh, the EU specifically has a lot less production uh, than the UK does. So the UK has oil and gas wells onshore, offshore production platforms, and LNG regasification wells as well. And then just following the entire supply chain down to um, residential, industrial, and commercial use. Um, so methane pollution occurs across the entire supply chain from production and processing and the import stages to transmission and the final stage of distribution. Um, in the UK, I was looking at gas and oil wells uh, with Emily. Uh, I was also looking at transmission compressor stations. So I visit a lot of national grid compressor stations. Uh, and yeah, the, that's pretty much most of the locations that I was visiting. Um, but when we're talking about um, you know, where this is occurring, it's occurring everywhere. And when we're thinking about reducing methane pollution, we just need to be thinking about uh, plumbing. I mean, what we're doing is, is not rocket science. It's, it's literally plumbing. We just can't see the leaks because as Danny was mentioning, it's invisible odorless gas uh, that's leaking out of the pipes. You know, so you can be staring at a pipe coming out of the ground like I was back in June uh, of last year in, in the oil fields of Romania. And you would never know that there's a, just a significant amount of gas pouring out of the pipe. Um, this was probably happening because there was too much gas at that facility and they needed to release pressure. But uh, it's always, it's sometimes unclear why the, the company itself is releasing the gas. Um, so I've been using a camera that's um, specifically designed for the oil and gas industry, as well as regulators to document methane emissions. It's called a FLIR GF320 infrared camera. Um, it, it is an infrared camera, and then it's calibrated at the specific wavelengths with which methane absorbs infrared radiation. Um, and it's one of the many tools that can be used to monitor methane emissions. It's been um, used by the oil and gas industry for almost two decades, and it's been recommended by the EPA since 2016 as a best practice to quickly find leaks and repair them. Now, um, detection, observation, measurement of methane emissions can be difficult and require a lot of specialized tools. This includes satellites, and complex machine learning algorithms to identify large sources, uh, flying airplanes and drones to take air samples, or using infrared air monitors and laser-based devices from the ground. Technology is constantly improving. It's you know uh, been a relatively new field in the last 10 to 15 years, and things are moving very quickly in terms of uh, the, the way we can detect and monitor methane emissions. However, for environmental organizations, these tools are not easily accessible. Uh, they're expensive. The FLIR camera itself is about a, a, a 100,000 euros. Um, so it's expensive for environmental organizations, but when you think about the amount of money that oil and gas companies have, um, and then the amount of money that they actually save when they are able to quickly detect leaks, uh, they can quickly make their money back within a few weeks of having this camera, uh, if not sooner. 
So they can be expensive uh, and take some training as well as uh, advanced knowledge. Um, but this isn't this isn't too difficult for the oil and gas companies to use uh, and the oil and gas companies to to um, implement. Um, so much of the methane detection work is often done by teams of scientists and researchers uh, or consulting firms that have access to this expensive equipment. Um, engineering expertise on oil and gas operations is really helpful. Uh, and in some cases, computer science backgrounds really help, especially when we're starting to talk about the new era of uh, satellite technology for detection. Uh, we're partnering with a lot of different groups out there as well that are using other forms of um, other forms of methane detection technology and and hopefully uh, trying to just you know uh, figure out the the smart policies that can then be implemented and um, the right techniques to actually use um, and and bring together all of these technologies to reduce methane emissions. So just a little background of who we are because I haven't talked about that yet. Um, we've been working on methane emissions in the oil and gas sector for almost two decades and are working very closely with civil society groups around the world, um, you know, not just in Europe, not just in the US, but pretty much everywhere to help fight for better regulations in their country, region, or local areas. Uh, we're also working closely with policymakers. Um, we have many uh, experts on staff who've been working on this for a long time in terms of providing technical expertise um, to talk about specific regulations in terms of how things can be implemented and technologies that need to be used, not just de methane detection technologies, but technology advancements that have occurred in the oil and gas industry that companies haven't implemented because it takes some investment in terms of money on their hand on, on, uh, to, to then reduce the methane emissions. Um, so we've been for, um, the, the countries in green are, are the countries that we have a current existing presence and by existing presence kind of means where we're working. Uh, we might not necessarily have boots on the ground on that particular location. Um, and then the countries in blue are places in the next two to three years where we're planning to work. Uh, one thing that you might notice is that the UK is actually in blue, but that should be switched to green because I've, I've recently visited there, but we're also, um, and I'm, I'm about to mention this uh, in more detail, but we just recently got funding to increase our work in the UK and we'll be hiring a, a policy person who will be working at the national level and engaging regulators uh, and government officials and policymakers, MPs. Uh, and, and then we'll be doing a, a lot more work in the UK and hoping to partner with groups like yourselves across the country to, on this issue. Um, so we're really working uh, around the world. Um, you know, we've, we've been doing a lot of work in the US, pushing the Biden administration for stronger oil and gas methane regulations. Um, you know, we've, we've worked a lot in, in Canada and Mexico as well as other countries in South America, including Colombia and Ecuador and Argentina, and then uh, Nigeria. And recently, uh, actually just today, we've expanded into Gabon and Cameroon. Um, and so we, you know, this is, this is work that's gonna need to be done everywhere. Um, you know, everywhere oil and gas operations are occurring. Uh, I, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the methane regulations in the EU as an important, um, stepping stone, I think, to the UK too, because I think the UK is going to be looking at what's going to happen in the EU and how the regulations play out and, and many countries around the world will be. Um, so, you know, the, the, the EU is going through a regulatory process. The, the EU Commission just released its uh, legislative proposal in December, and this year there's going to be a debate um, in Parliament and the Council on the regulations. And, and it's probably going to be a, a tough debate. Um, the industry is going to push back on a lot of our proposals uh, and probably a lot of the proposals that the, that the Commission put together. And we don't even see what the Commission put together as an extensive um, proposal. They, they certainly have a lot of elements missing from it. Um, but very simply, what we're looking for, and I talk about that, I'll talk about this at the end. And, and this is also what we're gonna be looking for in the UK because the UK doesn't have any regulations on methane emissions. 
uh, comprehensive leak detection and repair, a ban on cold venting and flaring, uh, transparent um, monitoring reporting and verification by the industry. Uh, in, in the EU, which is less relevant for the UK, we're really looking for um, the EU to push import standards uh, for countries where it's buying oil and gas. So we hope that we'll get some, some um, traction for the import standards, but uh, the commission was a little light on, on putting those together. Um, so in the UK, uh, there is no, there, there, the regulatory process for methane hasn't started. And you know, I know we're talking a lot about onshore oil and gas, and that's what a lot of you are concerned about. Uh, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the oil production in the UK is offshore. We don't have a good sense of you know, what the methane emissions are from offshore platforms anywhere around the world. Uh, it's really hard to, to uh, measure those emissions. And so our work plan in the UK in the next year is to, to really build the interest within government, get ministerial support on, on behalf of um, developing methane regulations. Uh, we wanna continue generating a lot of media coverage um, there was a lot of interest in, in my trip when I did come uh, prior to COP. And so uh, we're hoping to continue to engage journalists where we can. Uh, we want to develop social media toolkits with a lot of videos, a lot of photos, a lot of evidence of methane emissions throughout the UK that we hope that you can use. Uh, and you know, we can make those available. They, a lot of them are online already. Emily can share some with you. I can I've, I'll provide links as well. Um, we also want to do camera tours for media, uh, members of parliament, and other key policymakers. Uh, you know, if there's interest, if if you're talking with uh, any, if you if you have contacts with any media, if you have contacts with any policymakers, um, you know, we can. You know, I'm I'm based in Berlin. Another colleague of mine, I'm training to also do this work. He's he's based in Europe. We're hoping that you know we'll be able to quickly uh, respond and 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 do more tours in the UK to raise these issues uh, when and and show people. I mean, because it's really when you get out into the field, um, when you when you're standing in front of a facility and you don't see anything that um, with, your, with your bare eyes and then you look at the camera and you're, and you're just amazed by what's actually happening. Um, so we wanna work with you all, civil society partners and, and, and really, um, really put together some strong regulations on, on methane emissions in, in the UK. Um, there's a lot that, that we can do. So this was the, the tour that I did in, uh, in October, I visited a number of oil wells and compressor stations, and then a couple of other gas facilities uh, in the transmission sector, uh, and and found a substantial amount of emissions. So this was a national grid compressor station. You know, I can I can show you these videos. <laughs> Emily was showing you videos. I was showing you videos like this. Um, this was quite a big release of gas from the compressor station. This is fully processed, purified gas that's about an hour outside of London that you know, could have been going into people's homes. Um, but there was a leak in the system and, and so the, the gas was just being released right into the air. Uh, you know, I, I've been, I see this all over the place. You know, what, it doesn't matter what country I go to, where I go to. Um, you know, I've, see, I, I've seen a gas pipeline rupture in, in Romania. Um, this was underground pipeline in the oil fields. Gas was just coming straight out of the ground. Uh, and even in Germany, you know, Germans will say, oh, no, our system's perfect. There are, there's no problem. But uh, yeah, there are problems here in Germany as well. And so we're trying to raise awareness on this too here. Um, the, the thing is, and, and this is, I think, been stressed also by both Danny and Emily, there are simple policy solutions to reduce methane emissions. Uh, you know, this is these are what are asks par primarily in um, in in Europe are, but these are very standard across the world. 
Um, you know, if you look at the IEA's website, you'll come, you'll see that these are the top uh, solutions to reducing methane. It's just not being done. And, and so you can see, um, I have a link to at least our policy document for the EU uh, on this slide, and I'll share these slides later on, but um, you know, uh, you, can, you can read through our policy document. That will be a very similar policy document that we'll develop for the UK because it's also, it's, it's the same issues. There's no, there's no regulations. Companies are doing this without any accountability. Um, the regulator and the environmental authority in the UK is largely, um, you know, agreeing with what the companies say they're doing, and, and no one's kind of questioning it. So, um, although I, I would say that there's been some, a lot of what I've learned too about what's going on in the UK um, has been through uh, a lot of, you know, civil society groups members, and many of you um, and others who you know and work with, uh, asking questions from. The environmental authority you know we know that the kimridge oil site in uh the southeast has um is is releasing about 330 tons of methane annually that's a significant amount um the camera that i'm using can't actually quantify the total methane emissions but through the uh, request for information that was done a few years ago um you know, the environmental authority had asked the gas company and, and they published it. And I mean, 330 tons from one small well that's producing a very small amount of oil is, is, is kind of absurd. Um, you know, I, we, we've talked about it amongst, our, uh, amongst my colleagues and it's just like some of these oil wells that are producing so much um, gas or just venting so much gas, their days are numbered because, um, you know, they really can't continue to let this amount of gas leak into the air. We know so much more about methane, how much methane is contributing to global warming than we did even 10 years ago. And to let these, uh, the, these small marginal wells uh, release so much gas is criminal. Um, but there's no crime against it right now. Uh, Daniel's already mentioned this. Danny's mentioned the Global Methane Pledge, you know, and, and he's asking exactly the right questions and a question that hopefully we'll get into. There's, you know, what's, what's happening with the National Action, uh, action Plans on Methane? Um, does the UK have one? Probably not, not yet. Uh, but not only that, you know, where is the UK with, making sure other countries have it for COP27 because the COP26 team still sees the Global Methane Pledge as one of their big achievements. And so, you know, the UK is not just responsible for its own uh, national action methane plan, but it should be responsible for all the other countries around the world as well. So um, that's a, it's definitely an important question to ask. And, and, you know, the Global Methane Pledge is great in terms of like, it really got a lot of attention on methane, and I hope it's going to allow us to really work with many countries around the world to start moving, um, you know, moving the needle uh, and and getting them to actually think about uh, regulating, reducing their emissions. But you know, there's there's we're very far away from accountability for the methane emissions. And uh, countries need to create uh, action plans for reducing methane emissions. So um, these are good questions to be asking and, and moving to the next. Um, so we have a lot of resources available. Uh, we have our cutmethane.eu website. Um, you know, it's definitely geared towards the EU. We might develop one for the UK. I'm not sure where we are with that or, or where our thinking is with that, but it's possible we'll put one together. Uh, we have a Flickr page where we have a lot of photos, um, including the photos from my trip from the UK. Uh, I'm pretty sure if I've uploaded them, but if I haven't, I need to. Um, we do have on our YouTube page, um, you know, a lot of a lot of photo of videos, all of the videos we've shared, uh, as well as a specific link for um, all the UK emission videos. I have a link here also for our UK press tour statement as well. And then uh, just to conclude in terms of 
you know, calls for action. And I, and I assume we'll probably have more, you know, there'll be some more time for conversation on this is, you know, sharing videos, GIFs, infographics, and other visuals. We've, you know, we've created a lot of stuff, um, really highlighting, showing people this, taking deep dive on this issue like you are today and, and talking about thinking about methane, thinking about how you can maybe, you know, whether it's filing official complaint um, with your local or national regulator, starting ask for freedom of information requests from your regulator, uh, writing op-ed in your local paper, writing your MP. I mean, you know, if you talk to an MP and, and you ask them if you want to, if they want to go out and see the emissions at their at facilities, you know, in their, in, in their location, you know, I'm, you know, we can, we can schedule that, you know, so certainly stay in touch with us, communicate with us, um, follow up with me and or anyone from CATF um, or Emily and Emily can, can put you in touch or, uh, yeah, uh, anyone from Sika as well. So thank you very much. I hope this was helpful. I hope this was interesting. Uh, certainly reach out to me. I have my email address. I've got my Twitter and uh, um, our Clean Air Task Force Twitter account. So um, certainly follow us. Uh, we're constantly putting updates of what we're doing about methane uh, wherever we are. So thanks a lot. James, that was marvellous. Thank you so much. And you've got a series of fans now who are right behind you and we will do what we can in the UK. But I must say, our regulators uh, claim to be uh, world leaders, like our Prime Minister does, and they're lagging, badly lagging on all sorts of things. So, any questions? I noticed Tony Whitbread's got a question in. Do you want to put that, Tony? Yes, uh, so I was just asking basically whether um, it, it's a viable option to capture the gas and actually run electricity generators, therefore you don't need the gas infrastructure. Um, I think it depends on, on the facility and the amount of gas that's coming out of the facility. I, I think that's an important question to ask in certain locations. Um, I think the environmental authority said there was this question about at Kimridge specifically, and maybe Emily will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, they did ask about uh, setting up electricity on site to burn the gas. And, and for some reason, I don't know, Emily and I were going back and forth as whether they were actually doing this at Singleton. Um, but that's certainly the case, but there needs to be a certain amount of, of continuous gas flow is my understanding. I, I don't know what uh, that gas flow is. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that would be one, that would definitely be one option given a certain amount of gas flow. Uh, can I answer to that about Singleton? Apparently they are providing electricity on site with some of the gas. So that is, that's one positive. And they say heating, but there's no one, often it's, I don't know what they're heating, maybe that little man hut. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of options you have. I guess you have burning it on site to produce electricity. You have potentially compressing it on site, uh, especially as I mentioned in the comments earlier. If you know a lot of these, some of these sites are so far away from the processing station, they're just letting the gas vent. Um, you know, so you you could maybe compress it on site and then uh, transfer it to a facility. You could try to re-inject it on site. I mean, but, but that would require digging a new well to re-inject it. Um, yeah. Or, or burning it, uh, as Emily was talking about kind of the auto switches that would then burn the gas when there's enough gas to burn. And yeah. And when, sorry, one thing I didn't mention is that, uh, I, um, long class in one of iGas's sites in mid England was called upon by the EA and they said that it was 124,000 to, to do the capture and it was too expensive and they weren't, it, it was at the end of the well. So what we're at the end of the, the life of the well. So what we need is to just say, have them shut it down if they cannot, if they cannot do the best um, available technique then then but they're not being called on that so that's a problem there's a couple of questions about whether the issues of methane from other mines are being looked at as well what about methane leaks from coal mining yeah we so, not many coal um, mines here yeah yeah um 
certainly uh, methane from abandoned and closed coal mines is a major problem. Uh, our particular campaign with this camera, uh, we haven't looked at uh, emissions from abandoned coal mines or even existing coal mines for that matter um, yet. And, and the camera is primarily designed for oil and gas uh, because you need a certain concentration of methane in the, in the gas flow or the air, the vent. Um, to see it. So I don't know to what extent you'd be able to visualize it with methane. Um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of the satellite technologies uh, are also seeing major sources of emissions from coal mines. Right now, we don't have, um, you know, the, the satellites that are currently uh, in the sky are not designed to see um, small sources. So if, if you're aware, um, there was a, a recent scientific paper that was published two, two months ago that really highlighted all of the major sources of emissions. And these are really big sources of emissions. Um, so you didn't see any of them from the UK, but the satellites that will have available to us in the next two to three years, will probably start seeing some of these wells that I was seeing in um, that, that Emily and I had visited in, in the Southeast. Um, you'll probably see those on the satellites in, in two to three years. Um, but kind of differed from the coal mine issue. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's other techniques you would be using to look at, at coal mines. Um, we're looking at it, I don't know, um, you know, we'll probably be addressing it a bit in our UK policy um, work, but uh, certainly, um, we'll be mostly focused on oil and gas for, for the UK policy work. Well, from our point of view, that's good to hear, um, since we don't have a local coal mine. Um, can I suggest, uh, Richard Phillips, you've asked a question about Dale Vince, who's the founder of Ecotricity. Um, no, it was just, uh, I found his book very interesting, as uh, I'm sure many of you are aware of it. Um, but you know, where he really proposes we should deliberately grow grass, which you can do, I think, four crops a year, and then use anaerobic digesters to produce methane, which could go through the existing pipe grid and be used in domestic boilers, and so would be carbon neutral over a relatively short time scale. Um, but in view of what we've been hearing tonight about the risks you know of um well in fact the impact of methane as a you know um in terms of global warming um i wonder whether such a strategy is really viable um given the you know the clear potential risks of leakages from the distribution of methane or in the um, anaerobic digestion process itself and um, I think a few people have commented back on my question that it probably it probably is not a sensible strategy. Yes, there, there have been those sorts of answers. Oh. Um, anyone else got a question? I've taken most of the ones off the chat. Has anyone got a question that's come to mind? Want yeah, to put your hand up? Yeah, I'll oh, just okay. ask a quick question. Uh, um, yeah, thank okay. you, James, yeah. for your um, very useful uh, overview of the problems and uh, and so on. Um, talking about agriculture, I guess the agriculture sources are too small for the uh, your camera technology, and we'll have to rely on satellites. Is that right to pick up methane issues from that sector? Yeah, I I mean, and I wouldn't say that they're necessarily too small, but too dispersed. So the camera needs about uh, I think it's around five hundred parts per billion concentration of methane in like a very small area, right? So so, I mean, absolutely, you know, a large cattle farm could release significant tonnage of methane, but um, it would be, you know, dispersed over a large portion of the property. Uh, and, and yeah, I think the, the satellites will probably be able to will pick that up a little bit more. Great. Yeah, thank you. Derek, you wanted to ask something? I'd just like to ask James if when he went round, did he have any Geiger counters or method of measuring radon or any radioactive gases that are coming out. And we feel that here in West Sussex we have radon, but um, we, we really want to know where it's coming from. We think it's possible that Singleton are pumping it out along with the methane. 
um, which should be serious because uh, we're surrounded with uh, people who would like to think they're organic in their farming, particularly Goodwood Estate. And uh, um, we're, we're de deeply concerned that maybe it's not just methane we need to be worried about. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't have any other um, uh, instruments that could measure radioactivity. I, I had another instrument that could measure um, methane as well. Uh, but um, yeah, it, it was only measuring methane and CO2 uh, concentrations. So unfortunately, I didn't have Thank anything you. else to test. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's enough to be going on with, isn't it? Um, Sally and Jeff. Barnard asked about what Seeker should be doing. I've got some suggestions which came up because I went to COP26. There's an urgent need to do a thorough independent audit of UK fossil fuel subsidies. We need to get now that the next budget will reverse the A cut. And you know how much we heard about climate change in the, this recent announcement. Commit to putting climate at the heart of all new trade gear deals, announced there's no new coal mines, no new offshore oils and oil fields, and rule out Heathrow and Gatwick. So they're the suggestions coming out. And as someone noted, we are president of COP26 until COP27. So these ideas should be being put forward. Jeff, you wanted to say what she, Ray Seeker. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I want to start by thanking Danny for bringing this whole topic up, and and I have to I have to admit I kind of groaned when you did, Danny, <laughs> because um, you know we we've been feeling we've got our hands full enough dealing with the kind of mainstream kind of um, climate change issue, and um, but you know this is really focused on on this as a particular strand which is clearly very potent, and I guess it. The question is whether, how do we campaign on this? Because I would question whether um, this is a topic for mass campaigning, like all the seeker members across the whole of the Southeast getting behind methane, when we've got um, so many kind of more close to home issues to talk about, like home insulation or um, the switch to kind of clean green transport and things. Which are which were completely filling up our, our inboxes already. Um, I wonder whether is is this should we be changing focus away from those onto this, um, or is this more of a specialist campaign issue, which is not really a mass organisation thing. It's where we need kind of tech, really technical experts to go into the jugular with the right people at the right time. So it's not a kind of a grassroots campaign issue. It's a um, it's a specialist campaign issue. Um, and I'm, I'd be interested, um, James and, and all of you actually to comment on that, because I think for Sika, we're, we've got to figure out where to focus our effort. And um, we have to be confident that if we're gonna do something, it'll be an effective route to achieve change. I, I, before I let anyone else answer, with the chair um, uh, accorded to me, it will be the fastest way to help climate change. Just to reduce those emissions is the fastest way to do it. So that's a, a, a standard sort of um, inspiration. Danny's got his hand up. I don't know whether James wanted to comment. Shall I got the, ask Danny to comment first? Yeah, maybe, maybe James yeah. can answer. Yeah, I, I, I just picking up what uh, Jeff, Jeff just said. Um, I wanted to ask James, the, the creation of this uh, policy post um, that you're thinking about uh, creating in the UK, when is that going to be in place, do you think, James? Because to me, um, I think Jeff's hit the, the nail on the head. We need to um, use some specialist techniques, i.e. get MPs, get the media out there, in, get this in their face, because if you don't do that, you're, not, you're, gonna, you're gonna get the usual being palmed off by, by MPs. I, I mean, I have this all the time with my MP in Hampshire. So it, we do need the hard evidence. We just need to we need something which hits them between the eyes. And I think, I think what you've been doing is fantastic. So um, what's your sort of thoughts on timelines to be in a position to do that? Is my question. Yeah, I mean, well, we're currently, we're hiring for this position right now. Um, 
so we're we're looking we haven't i don't know if we started the interview process yet um but you know i i think in the next couple of weeks next couple of months um and we're already having meetings with government officials in the uk so i think it's a really good and important question um you know that that was raised uh, about how to focus on it we certainly have a lot of this uh, specialist expertise in terms of you know because sometimes when you get into oil and gas industry and processes it's like um, it, it can get complex and it's taken me a little while to to learn a lot about it I don't have an engineering background per se but have certainly um, used both our experience and expertise in-house as well as the connections and network we have externally to, to really learn a lot about these processes. Um, and so we, we um, are really happy to play that role as the technical experts because we do often. And so I think what we're going to want to do is really um, get groups like yourselves and, um, you know, groups across the UK who are interested in uh, it's supporting you know these initiatives so it doesn't seem like we're coming we're this outsider who's um, coming in and telling you know UK government what they need to be doing uh, so that there's a lot of grassroots support behind it so we're certainly happy to play the the technical expertise role also having meetings with MPs bringing meetings out to MPs but we also don't have necessarily all of the um, you know, knowledge of who, where are the right pressure points? Um, who are the people we, we really need to be talking to? Um, and, and so I think that's where we would rely on, on groups like you to help with that too. I think we have got a lot of contacts and helpful uh, openings between us. So we must pursue that um, debate. Anne, you've got your hand up. Sorry if I've missed it. Um the question was what SICA could do. I mean, obviously, you have got pressures of all sorts of things. But to put it at a local level, um, you know, th that filming showed how much there was in terms of methane leaks and also of venting. Um, the UK government has committed to uh, no flaring by 2030. When they do that, they actually are talking more about offshore yeah. uh, um, oil and gas rather than onshore but nevertheless onshore gas it, uh, oil and gas is still part of the policy they have this get out clause about it not being um, uh, you know commercially viable but you know seeker could put pressure on the local oil companies to check on the, their leakage regularly to deal with their leakages regularly uh, put pressure on the um, EA to follow that up um, and there there is a meeting um, being written and I, I, I sent a copy to Danny I, I don't know if that is officially the policy now or whether it's still um, a, a draft policy but one of the things there is that every company is expected to produce their own methane reduction plan by, by next year. So again, seeker members or the seeker as a campaign group could actually put pressure on the EA to, to pursue that and make sure that the local companies are doing it. Tony, can you do your question a minute? I'm trying to share it out. I forgot what I was going to say. No, here we are. Yes. <laughs> Um, no, I think I, what, I, what was forming in my mind is actually the, the key point here is about regulation and the lack of implementation of regulation. Therefore, the target, I'd have thought, is the Environment Agency, who we know are underfunded, but it must be a, largely to do with restoring funding to the Environment Agency, which is one aspect of regulation. There are probably others. Now, we can't have these technologies if they're not properly regulated, and they're not properly regulated. Danny, you better take it. Uh, yes, uh, I'd just say, uh, th thank you to Anne for just reminding uh, uh, me about the, ups the UK Upstream Oil and Gas Sector Methane Action Plan 2021. But of course, this was written before COP26. So uh, I think the question is still uh, extant. You know, is there, uh, is, this, is this the final th product that the UK should be working to in terms of its methane, methane action plan? 
it's not clear to me. So I think uh, I think we still need to know whether this this plan that exists at the moment is going to be updated to reflect COP26. Thank you. Any other last questions? I think we uh -huh. need to hand back to Danny to wind up. Just to, I had a one one thing. Jill, is, is the way that the, the water company was dealt with was through legal battle with the environment agency as well. And I know that this is annoying, but to bring, to, to take a legal case against the EA for not protecting the air is a possibility, that's all. Okay. Yeah. Right, client earth, because we have been, I know I, as a member of CICA, but I've been, we've been campaigning and trying how many times with, and Derek's gone now, but we have reached out about 75 times in the last four months <laughs> to various people and they're not listening. So at a certain point, you have to think of different strategies and, and that, that is one, one option. Derek's yeah. iPad is back on. Derek, uh, can you hear us? Sorry, we lost you. Do you want to give your question a minute? No, I, I do apologise. I hit something that went. It was just <laughs> to say, on the Climate Change Committee, produced a report saying that methane wasn't an important issue to go to net zero because it had a short life of 9.6 years. I, I, I fail to understand that, and I feel that is so serious that... Um, I raised it with them, but uh, I haven't had the answer back yet. Okay. Jeff, you've got your hand up, but we have to finish. Yeah. I think yeah. we're approaching uh, the end of our I'm timing. I'm trying to wrap up a bit, but too, actually. Um, but it, it seems to me this, this is a, an area where some, some real strategic thinking is needed to find the most effective way to progress on this. And I wonder, James, if this is actually, in a sense, a task for your new recruit when they finally arrive in their office, because I, I can see um, a lot of ineffectual mass campaigning by, if it's not coordinated, but a, a very strategic campaign, which asks that question, is it legal? Do we go to the EA? Do we go to the government? Who do we go to? I feel that that is probably would be really helpful um, before Seeker kind of throws itself at this in a big way. But I can, I'm sensing a, a, a sense that we're, We'd love to play a part, but we'd like to be targeted and pointed in the right direction. Um, so um, we'd be happy, very happy to get some guidance from you when you when you've kind of got got up and running on that. Thank you, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, Danny, it comes to you to wind up. Oh, okay, um, okay. I'll just I'll just share my screen up for a couple of slides, and then we will call it a day. So I think when we when we put it, we started putting these presentations together, and, and of course um, we didn't know what I didn't know what James was going to say, and I wasn't sure what Emily was going to say. I thought we were going to be really in a bad place, and I was trying to think, well, maybe we should stay positive. Well, um, I'm not sure I can do that, um, given what I've said, and given what James has said, and given what I've, I've done in terms of rereading reread the IPCC report. But I suppose there is some good good news. And James, I think it's very heartening to think you're going to get provide a policy officer in the UK. And then, as uh, Jeffrey suggested, I think there's a there's a there's an, a focal point, an opportunity there for us to do something uh, coherent and impactful in getting our messages across about the concerns about uh, methane. Um, I just wanted to also highlight <coughs> that um, it's not all about oil and gas; it's agriculture as well which actually in the face of it is, going, is bigger, uh, a bigger problem, but maybe because of the way that uh, uh, you know, methane emissions happen in the agricultural sector, it's not so uh, easy and tangible to get, to get hold of uh, and make, make the case in the story, but um, I'll, I'll leave that there. Um, thankfully and thoughtfully, IEA has launched its methane tracker to try and reconcile the various and often conflicting sources of data um, and I'm showing that on screen at the moment. So I think that's, um, that, that is good news. I think the other thing is it, it wouldn't be lost upon us with the Ukraine crisis to know that suddenly we've all warmed to green energy. And, and, it, it, is, and it is now with the, the increase in price of uh, fossil fuels, it is not beyond the realms of possibility now 
because of the economic viability to capture methane and stop flaring um, and use that either at, you know, on, on location at site or somehow to get that into, into the current uh, uh, um, industrial process or the domestic ring main. So I think there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a possibility there. Um, so I think it's already been said, you know, we can campaign, we can put some our thoughts together about asking for more frequent inspections. You know, the technology is there. Should there be 24 seven flow monitoring on all these sites? You know, is that what we should be pushing for whilst we work out, uh, you know, uh, the demise of uh, oil and gas over the and phase it out over the next 10, 10, 10 years or so? I, I think, uh, Emily, you picked up and talked very much uh, uh, clearly about the toxic compounds that come out when this stuff is burnt. You know, the World Health Organization Global Air Quality Guidelines are quite clear. They've been, they've, these, these standards have, have been raised. We should not be putting uh, stuff into, uh, in, into the, uh, in the atmosphere uh, in terms of air quality. And air quality is the other the flip side of climate change. And so it is a complete nonsense. So um, I suppose in, in wrapping this up, um, I, I think uh, we've, we've answered my question that methane's role in the climate and ecological emergency is a neglected factor. And I would just summarize again and say, it's not all just about oil, it's also about agriculture, which we shouldn't forget. Um, so those are my final thoughts. Well, Danny, thank you very much for that. Well, I don't know, it remains for me to actually close this evening off. And um, I think we've, we've all kind of learned something but also, I think what is more important, it almost begs the question now to refocus our minds into what are the next steps and how are we going to take this forward? So um, I would like to thank all our speakers, Danny, Emily and James particularly, and very much also to Jill for, for facilitating the discussions. And of course, everybody taking part takes home a little bit of what they can possibly do within their um, activists and campaign groups that they are. But I think the impression I am left with very much is that this conversation is only just starting. It is really up to us to, to see where we can take the next level to campaign at that higher level for all of us. So thank you very much for spending your Friday night with us. We will make this available and thank you very much for coming. Thanks, Rib. Thanks, Viv. Thank you. Well done, everyone. That was great.